face is also. I'm so sorry. No problem. I'll start again. Uh, my name is Jenny McFarland. I'm the conservation biologist for the Peace and Audubon Society. And I'm going to be co presenting this talk today with Olia Phillips, who should also be on your screen, who's the citizen science coordinator. And together, we are two members of the conservation department at the Tucson Audubon Society. Uh, we tend to be two of the faces that I think get seen quite frequently as representatives of the conservation department at Tucson Audubon, but it's actually quite a large department. And that's part of what we're gonna be talking about today is some of the different work that happens uh, within this department. I have been told more than once by board members and members and other staff that the conservation department is far too modest when it comes to things that we've been doing. We're not great about talking about ourselves and talking about some of the really fun, very interesting, impactful work that gets done in this department. And that is true. And we're trying to turn that around, which is part of why we're doing this talk today is to try to share everything that we're doing. But there is a wing of the conservation department that is even more modest, and that is the restoration group. So I do have a little photo of them up here on this, this first slide, those, those photo of the two little people down in the, the meadow in the field here planting stuff. It's a little hard to see, but there's a, a million little landscaping flags in here because this is a lot of hard work happening in the Cuckoo Corridor near uh, Patton Center for Hummingbirds in, in Patagonia, where right across the road is what we call the Cuckoo Corridor, a piece of land that is uh, also owned by Tucson Audubon where extensive restoration work, planting of baby plants, removal of invasive plants uh, has happened over several years along this uh, drainage of Sonoma Creek to try to create new habitat. So there's a huge amount of work that happens in this department. A lot of it is bird surveys, but a lot of it is, is really difficult on the ground conservation that is shovel work. A lot of shovel work <laughs> happens in this department. So we're gonna talk about that as well since they are absolutely dreadful about self-bragging and sharing some of the amazing work that they do. So some other photos we have here on this intro slide is some little long spurs zooming through the grasslands, looking like little little missiles as they launch through the, the grasslands. Those are chestnut collared long spurs, a priority key species for us, as well as some nesting Western screech owls. It's Howie and Holly and their, their, lovely, their lovely family that they raised uh, this spring. So that's of course some of our nest box work. So it's a lot of different type of work that happens, but all with the same mission of conservation and creating better habitat and preserving habitat for native birds of Arizona. So go ahead, Olya, to the next slide. Okay, so Tucson Audubon has quite the history of bird surveys. So I'm a little partial to bird surveys. This is the main thing that I coordinate uh, and have since I was hired here in 2010. And bird surveys are a big part of what Tucson Audubon does in terms of bird conservation. So this was, I'm sure the history goes back even further, but the history that I know of going back is to 2004 Tucson Audubon was a founding partner of the Arizona Bird Areas Program. So what, what is that? <laughs> what is the IBA program? Important Bird Areas Program. This is a program that is international. It's a large international effort that's headed up by, by an organization out of the United Kingdom called BirdLife International. And they are the global coordinator. Yeah, that black box, is everyone else seeing that too? Okay, I'm not sure what that is. I just saw a comment about that. Um, okay. Looks like it's black box where it's it's off to the it's off to the right part of the screen. I don't know. Is this better? Yes, now it's gone. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you for that comment. Uh, was it sure if that was just showing to me or not? So BirdLife International, which I have their logo there at the bottom center, is uh, oh there it is again. Is um, a really interesting organization. They do, they do a lot of really good international conservation work all over the world. And one of the programs they have is the Important Bird Areas Program, which then they have a partner in, you know, they participate in like 178 countries have Important Bird Areas Program. And then in the United States, it is headed up by a partner organization of uh, the National Audubon Society. So each country sort of has a, a organization that's tapped that then runs it for that 
country. So in the United States, it's Audubon. And then how it happens in the United States is then it's broken down by the state. So within Arizona, the program is, was co-founded by the Tucson Audubon Society and Arizona Game and Fish, and then uh, was then joined in by what's now known as Audubon Southwest, but was Audubon Arizona at the time. And this program is, I think, extremely effective and runs this um, statewide program to recognize and identify the most important habitats for native birds in Arizona. Uh, go ahead to the next slide, Julia. So Game and Fish is a, a fiscal partner of this program. We really couldn't do this work without them. They're really quite important. So there are 48 important bird areas in Arizona. 19 of those have global IBA status, which means they're recognized as globally significant habitat for a global priority species. So this can be a bird species. This can be uh, like we have several that are global for spotted owl, Mexican spotted owl, a few that are for the chestnut colored longspur. We even have a few for sandhill crane. So these, those tend to be very species focused, but this is an extremely active program where we have had over 500 volunteers over the last you know, seven to 10 years. And I have more than a hundred that are active right now. And it's a huge community science effort. And it involves identifying which areas should be important bird areas. And then once they're identified, continuing to monitor those important bird areas. So it's got a lot of bird survey component and it's that huge crew of dedicated and trained volunteers that really make it possible. So we do have a lot of surveys that happen that are sort of all species, regular scheduled uh, monitoring surveys. So like I have a, a really great crew in Sabino Canyon and Tinker Verde Wash that do quarterly, uh, quarterly plus surveys where they just literally monitor. They walk the same route every time and record all their bird species. So that sort of work is sort of always happening in the background of IBA. So what's going on here at the bottom of the screen here is that's the header for our website. So because it's a statewide program with multiple partners, it does have its own website in addition to the Tucson Audubon website. So if you go to azibaorg you can see a lot of information about the IBA program. All right, go ahead, Olya. And a lot of the results that we're gonna talk about today, if they were IBA surveys, are, are on that website, linked to and, and housed on that website. So here's a map showing where the IBAs are, the important bird areas are within Arizona. And you can see some of them are quite big, <laughs> some are quite small, but they do range throughout the entire state. So they go uh, north to south, you know, all the way up to the Grand Canyon and all the way as far south as the Atascosa sort of literally runs up to the US-Mexico border. We have several along the Colorado River to the west and several right on the east, eastern border of New Mexico. So they really span the entire state and uh, really focus on some of those really critical habitats and encompass different types of habitats. All right, go ahead, Olya. Unsurprisingly, there is quite a cluster in that southeast corner of the state. <laughs> so we do a lot of those all species surveys that run in the background, which actually I'm gonna be adding more routes in the, the very near future, if you are interested uh, in the Sonoran Desert around Tucson. But we do a lot of species specific surveys because the IBA program is so species driven in terms of they want you to monitor priority species, especially. Uh, we do a lot of that. And they're also really popular with volunteers and they're a lot of fun <laughs> to be fair, they're a lot of fun to do. So these are some photos of chestnut collared longspurs, which are a really cool bird. They are, I've seen it bounce around on lists as they come out, you know, every six months from different conservation organizations. They're always on the list of top 10 fastest declining species of North America, bird species. And they're often in the top three and every now and then they come in as top one. So this is a critically declining, very, very rapidly declining uh, species. And it is a really interesting one. They, they breed up in the short, the tall grass prairies of like the Dakotas and Idaho, that kind of uh, up into Canada, that portion of the United States is where they nest. And then they winter down here in Chihuahuan desert grassland. So in Southeast Arizona through sort of Southwest Texas and then mostly in Sonora, Mexico and Chihuahua, Mexico is where they winter. So their wintering grounds and their breeding grounds are both under pretty serious assault which is uh, from habitat loss, which is causing a, a lot of their decline. But they're really cool birds. They look like sparrows, but they're actually much closer related to birds like snow buntings. They're in that like sort of old, like the old 
the bunting category. They're really, really cool birds and they're very charismatic. If you haven't seen them and you're around here in the winter time, I highly suggest you go look for them because they're really cool and they hang out in places like La Cienegas and the San Rafael Valley, which are both global IBAs for this species. So we do a lot of work with them. Go ahead, Olya. And I just want to touch on them briefly. I know this is supposed to be a talk about the spring surveys, but that is a really important one that we do. Um, another project that we have only in the last few years, sort of always running in the background, <laughs> is our, our new love of these sound recorders. So this is a really cool technology. They're from Wildlife Acoustics, which is a company that specializes in equipment for bird survey or just for wildlife monitoring. A lot of their uh, equipment is for bats. Some of it's for frogs, but we use the equipment that is very suitable for birds. So they're electronic devices that you put out on the landscape and they just, you can program them to record ambient sound. So we've done some different experiments with them. We do have a bat one too that we put out sometimes to get bat data, which is really cool. But we have um, these electronic devices that we put out. We've done different studies with them. We did a cuckoo study in uh, the Coronado National Forest in 2016 with the Forest Service, which is actually how we found out about this technology and began to appreciate how really cool it was. We did a winter survey by putting the reporters out at cattle tanks in the grasslands to see how often the long spurs came to the tanks. Uh, this last spring, we did a moonlight study with elf owls, putting the reporters out program to record at night to see if there was a change in how much elf owls vocalized according to moon phase, which is something that has been published about quite a lot and no one seems to be able to agree. We also put them out to see when Lucy Forblers first arrived. So these recorders, they don't make sound. They only, they don't instigate, like they don't play a call to try to get the bird to call back or anything. They just passively record. So they really only work well if you're targeting a species that makes a lot of sound. So <laughs> all these species do. And we have put them out too for a few other things. Like I have them out for Purple Martins right now. We're putting them out for um, uh, trying to see where different places Purple Martins might be in the Altar Valley. So they work really well for, for birds that make a lot of noise. But go ahead, Olya. And it's very cool technology with really cool software that goes with it. So the good old fashioned surveys of people going out and looking for things is still our absolute bread and butter. This is such a good way. Now, oftentimes those sound recorders work really well in tandem with in-person surveys. I have rarely found an instance where they work well without an in-person component as well. They work really well to sort of verify occupancy, but if you want actual numbers of birds and exact locations, you just gotta go out in the field and look for them the old school way. So this is some information data we have from our gilded flicker surveys of the Tucson Sky Islands IBA, which is a very large IBA to the east of Tucson, which is Saguaro National Park East, plus uh, uh, Catalina State Park, plus that whole section of Coronado National Forest that is like Mount Lemmon and into the, in the ring ponds, which is mostly park service land. But huge, huge IBA. It's got desert and Sky Island in it. And this Sonoran Desert aspect within the Saguaro National Park, we did uh, the flicker callback surveys, which was great. It was a lot of fun. People found a lot of flickers. And this is a species that is a continental qualifying IBA bird, which is why we focused on it. And Sonoran Desert, of course, being a big focus for Tucson Audubon. So if you wanted, all these maps that I'm gonna show are screenshots, but they're all Google My Maps, which means they're, um, you can, move around in them. They're, you can zoom in, zoom out, sort of pan around. They're, they're interactive maps. So those are all available on that azibia.org website. And I will also include the links in the follow-up message after this talk. So go ahead to the next slide, Olivia. So Gilda Flickers was a big priority one for us, but the mo by far the most popular survey that we've offered in the last few years is the elf owl survey. <laughs> I should have seen this coming because elf owls are the best. They're so cool. They're so fierce and adorable and just amazing birds. But man, this has been such a fun survey to do. And we've done it the last several years and we did a really, really good survey this spring. So in April we had, um, and Saguaro National Park has been a partner in these surveys from the beginning. They've been so great giving us special access to the park after hours, even uh, giving us a few staff to help, a few interns to help with the survey. <laughs> it's been great, uh, very, very good partners. And um, we give all that data to them as well. And Pima County has also been a very good partner in helping us um, when we do the West Side surveys in Tucson Mountain Park. So 
the survey results this year were very interesting. We had a lot of alfalfa, so our total there was over 200, that 200 detections, it's like 218, I think, detections of alfalfa over the two night survey. And that was high, it was a very good survey. And I think a lot of it had to do with the late arrival. The alfalfa, a lot of people were commenting that, hey, I, I usually get an alfalfa in my yard. I haven't had one, what's going on? And they seem to be about two weeks late this year. And I think that made a difference on the survey. I think it made them a little more detectable because they were at an earlier nesting phase than we usually see them on this survey weekend. And the females were being very noisy and the males were being very noisy and it made them really easy <laughs> to survey for them. So our number was quite high, but it, this is about to be a theme that you're gonna see is that they seemed a bit late. Go to the next slide. They seemed a bit late this year. They did turn up and they seems like they turned up in pretty normal numbers, but quite late. So this is our data from the West Side Survey, which happened uh, on a consecutive night of the East Side Survey. And we had a lot of LFLs here too. It was good. So we do the portion of Tucson, um, which would be the Saguaro National Park West region, plus Tucson Mountain Park of Pima County. And uh, Pima County is now a very valued partner in, in helping us do these surveys. So we had a lot of, of owls on the West Side too. And we record all species. That's why there's different colors here. The little brown markers are the elf owls, but the other colors are other night birds like Western screech owls, common poor wills, great horned owls. So we do record all the birds we find, but those elf owls are the main focus. And that's very much IBA tied where they are a continental qualifying species for, for IBA. Go ahead, Julia. And they're really cool birds, incredibly charismatic. They just do, and the fact they live right near town is, is very cool, very fun survey with good, really good results this year. So elegant trogans, this is another extremely popular survey that we do as part of, you know, Tucson Audubon coordinates as part of the um, important bird areas program. And this is the biggest survey we do. It's, it's kind of the flagship survey of, of the Arizona important bird areas program where it's a big deal. It involves close to hundred people just for the survey alone for all five mountain ranges over three weekends. It's a, it's a lot of work, it's a huge effort, and it is really the only breeding season survey of elegant trogans anywhere in the United States. And this is by far the stronghold breeding population within the United States. So we are the ones that are monitoring these birds. Um, and it has been great. It's been so fun doing these surveys. We get tons of help, tons of support, and just communities really come out and help us count these birds. And this did get a little bit of press this year because as you can see from the, the chart here of the summary of our data over from 2013 through this year, there was a pretty steep decline in the number of trogans counted during the survey. Now these surveys happen in late May, mid to late May. So we always do these surveys um, for the consistency of the sample. We do keep them on the same weekends year to year. So it's those last two weekends of May plus uh, mid-May for the atoscosis. So it was quite low. We had 68 total trogans counted this year, as opposed to uh, 2020, where we had 201, which is a high count last year, plunged down to 68. This did get some media attention. So the Daily Star did a, a story about this survey. And um, in that article, I predicted that if we got heavy monsoon rain, we would see an increase in trogans. And that does seem to be the case. We have gotten a lot of rain now, and I'm getting a lot of reports from people of trogans turning up where they were not before, very significantly in the Chiricahua Mountains, where on survey day, we counted three. And now there seems to be multiple breeding pairs in South Fork. So they turned up late, and they are breeding way late, months later than they usually do. Uh, copulation's been observed. Nesting's been observed months later than normal, but they are going for it. And the way this monsoon's been, I think it's gonna be well worth their time to, to try to breed. Let's go ahead, Olya. But very cool survey and very much a bird that is charismatic and, and, and indicative of this, this Southeast Arizona amazing bird habitat. So I also have a, a very cool interactive map that you can access on our website. You can zoom in and see where the trogans were. The different color icons indicate different things. So like the little red face is a male, the orange face is a pair. So this is the data from the survey. So the X's are areas that were searched, but no trogans were found. So it's not that nobody looked, it's that someone looked very carefully <laughs> and did not find trogans. So I turned it off to take this screenshot, but I do have a layer right below it that you can turn on and off called additional sightings outside of survey. So that's where I'm putting all the data as it comes to me of people saying, oh, 
Chris Trogan's nesting in Madera Canyon, I'm putting that kind of information in that separate layer. So this is outside of survey data, but it, it, it informs us of what happens if a drought breaks, if a drought ends. So that's been a very cool map to pan around in. And you can also turn on previous years too that are on that map if you like and see and kind of compare what happened year to year. So go ahead, Ola, to the next slide. But it has been fascinating seeing what happened with the trogans. And this is part of the story. So the monsoon is really important for all these species. Even those wintering birds, like the, the chestnut collar and longspurs, are vastly affected by the monsoon. Since those grasslands, a lot of their food stores are created during the monsoon. So if those grasslands don't turn green and produce seed, there's not going to be seed for the, the longspurs to eat during the winter. So this past winter survey, actually our longspur numbers were incredibly low, like fewer than 10 in the San Rafael Valley, where usually we get three to 400, up to 500. So very, very low. And when I checked the eBird data the, about central Mexico, there was enormous numbers of longspurs. So I think they just they clustered far further south than they normally do. That's how they adapted to that, that challenge. But this is the 2018 monsoon rainfall and how this map works is these are really cool maps that you can access from the University of Arizona, where they keep track of rainfall and then they show it using, you know, mapping technologies and they're assigning colors to the number of inches that, of rainfall that fell in those areas during the monsoon only. So which they count as mid-June through the end of September. So this is a map from 2018. You can see there's some you know, lots of red clusters on this map, north of Tucson, you know, and then light green. So it ranged from six to 12 inches, uh, sort of in Southeast Arizona in 2018. Go ahead, Olya. And these are really cool and you can access them yourself and play around with them. They're really, really cool maps. It's a nice free service that U of A offers. So this is 2019, which was a you know, relatively normal year where you had just about 12 to 14 inches in, in spots south of Tucson around Sierra Vista and the Chiricahuas. And then around Tucson, it was at least within town, it looks like maybe six inches in the desert and then up to 10 in the mountains, which is a bit low, but relatively normal. Go ahead, Olya, to the, to the next one. But it's not by no means a, a high monsoon, but here's 2020 and it's just absolutely falls off the table. It's really, really low. And you can see here the number, the color scale is actually changing, it's so low. So red patches are six inches on this map of 2020. That's how low the rainfall was. And uh, up through orange is only eight. Whereas before we were getting you know, 12 to 15 in those, those orange categories. So very, very, very low monsoon. It was absolutely, you know, it was heartbreaking to see how bad it was. And everyone started calling it a non-soon because it was just so little rainfall. Go ahead, Olya. And interestingly, U of A is generating maps day by day of the of an incomplete set. So this is 615 through yesterday, 615 to 725. This is the monsoon so far this year. And orange to red is 8 to 12. And you can see that you know the whole southeast Arizona is anywhere from 5 to 12 inches just so far this year. Like and it's July is not even over yet. We have all of August and by their calculation, all of September left for the monsoon. So we are way ahead of the curve this year, this year's monsoon, uh, as opposed to last year's monsoon. I mean, it was absolutely staggering how severe that drought was last year. You know, and if, if you visited Southeast Arizona or you live in Southeast Arizona, I mean, you could see it firsthand. Everything looked completely and utterly desperate. I mean, late May into June, until like through June, it was so dry and it was just absolutely, the animals were just absolutely desperate for, for water and the plants looked like they were all dying and it was just awful. So go ahead, Olya. And that really impacted a lot of our surveys and a lot of our, our nest box results for this year. So this is a really cool map too that U of A made showing rainfall disparity. So the um, sort of like the browner an area is the, the, the more below average rainfall happened for the monsoon of 2020. So this is really a very cool map. <laughs> it's also really neat. I'm really, I'm really impressed with this stuff that U of A is putting out, this their uh, sort of agriculture extension. Very interesting stuff. They're doing really cool mapping. And I encourage you to check it out. If you just Google, you know, U of A monsoon map, you'll see all these amazing options that they have. It's really, really interesting to look at. And it's been very informative for trying to figure out what's going on with some of the birds that Oli and I have been, and our, and our many volunteers, the whole department, plus our many amazing volunteers have been keeping an eye on. All right, go ahead, Olya. 
All right, there seems to be a bit of a lag between me changing the slides. Yeah, and it's happened before. Um, so that's so why I gave a sentence or two while it's changing. Yeah, sorry about that. But um, yeah, so the past year has been difficult for nesting birds in Arizona. And we were able to monitor this behavior or their adapting behavior um, of the target species that we monitor for our nest box program. So due to the drought conditions, many species that we were monitoring altered their nesting behavior and had different nesting success than previous years. And I wanna show you a couple examples. Some variation in nesting time is normal, but we started to see a pattern across different species. So this is definitely um, the year that we're experiencing and not just um, a variation within one species. So both of the raptor species on our live cameras started laying their eggs uh, two whole weeks later than years before. Likely they were waiting for higher prey numbers, but I'm just speculating here. Uh, both of the American kestrel and the screech owls successfully fledged their chicks this year, so that's good. Lucy's warblers um, seemingly had the biggest effect of the drought that I saw. Some of the sites like Tubac didn't start seeing egg laying until end of April and beginning of May, which is normally when they're starting their second brood by this time. And I also noticed that they were having smaller broods and only one to two chicks were fledging. Uh, many have abandoned their nests before even laying eggs and um, many did not have a second brood the way they normally would. No, so not a good year for them, but that's the ebbs and flows of breeding success with birds and I'm sure they'll rebound next spring. Our bluebird boxes near Sonoida, they became active closer to the end of April and beginning of May when normally there's a lot of activity in April. Um, they also started nesting later into the season than previously seen. So this year um, we've had six bluebird and six flycatcher nests in those boxes. So thankfully we're still seeing activity there. On a lighter note, this year we had made good progress on our um, NABS grant study, North American Bluebird Society gave us a grant to study Lucy's warblers up close and personal using cameras. And we were able to purchase 10 tra trail cameras and three live cameras. One was also donated to us. Live cameras were used in places that had success um, or access to an outlet and Wi-Fi. And this allowed us to have that 24 seven monitoring of the nests without disturbing the birds. Trail cameras were equipped with close-up lenses and we installed them in two back pointed at active nests. We're hoping to record major events uh, during nesting as well as any potential nest parasitism and uh, predation, if, if that happened. And so we're able to perfect our technique in installing a close-up lens on a set of uh, no-glow trail cameras. So that just means that they do not have a flash that would disturb nesting birds at night. Um, the middle price range cameras that we were buying are designed for detecting things from a larger distance than we, what we were hoping to use them for. So putting a close-up lens really helped us capture things up close. And here's a couple of snippets of what we saw. Uh, this is a cowbird female checking out a beginning of a Lucy's warbler's nest. Lucy's did not end up nesting here actually for whatever reason. So the cowbird did not lay an egg there. And this is an example of uh, our view that was of an active nest. And this nest uh, successfully fledged just one chick. Again, the low brood numbers this year. And this Buick's wren here was uh, stealing Lucy's warbler nesting material. It's a hot commodity. If someone already co collected it, might as well take. Buick's wrens are, that's in their character, I think. Uh, 
Um, so we'll continue to use our trail cameras and learn more about what happens where we're, we're not there. And our technique has definitely improved over this past year. Shifting gears here to our next program update. We have so much news to share with you. So we're kind of just zooming by, but um, we're happy to answer any questions as well. So we launched a brand new program this year. It's called Bird Safe Buildings. We're able to do so with the help of two grants, one from National Audubon and another from Tracy Aviary, who are our long-term supporter and have also funded our Lucy's Warbler study a few years back. And with this program, we aim to address the two factors of bird window strikes, the residential low-rise buildings, as well as the commercial high-rise buildings. As of today, we have 120 program registrants. The registration we have on our website serves as a way for us to get a sense of who and where people are taking action to prevent window strikes and also which methods they're using. Each participant who opted in received a letter of recognition and a program decal that you're seeing in the upper right corner there. We also distributed a clo uh, close to 400 free uh, decal kits, and you're seeing them in action on the lower right. And those are used to as an outreach and also for people to take action. They're free. If you would like one, we have them at our nature shop counter for pickup. We also distributed them at various bird related shops, as well as Tucson Wildlife Center and Reed Park Zoo to reach the um, general public. We also created a demonstration wall at Mason Center here on the northwest side. Um, this is the north side of the main house, displaying four different ways to make your windows visible to birds and prevent window strikes. Um, the methods displayed here are of various prices, difficulty of installation and coverage. So you can check it out in person at Mason Center or I would also encourage you to watch our YouTube video of how I put them up and what it looks like and the price points and everything like that. Uh, I'll also share this link in the follow-up email for you to see. And as part of the program, we also created walking routes uh, to document strikes during migration period in downtown Tucson and University of Arizona. The information um, is to be used to contribute to the national database as well as identifying particularly problematic buildings here. Um, at the time, at the same time, we recorded migration intensity in Arizona um, using birdcast.org. Interestingly, um, so this is what it would look like for the whole uh, state for the night of, for example, this one is May 6th and the different uh, levels of high, medium, and low. And interestingly, we found carcasses of migratory species after a medium to high migration intensity in the area. And since most songbirds migrate at night, the mortality um, were found the morning after. So each of the red stars you're seeing here represent a collected species uh, corresponding to a date and uh, migration intensity. We documented seven total casualties, two house finches, one morning dove, white one, one white winged dove, one cliff swallow, one black headed gross beak and one western tanager. So we didn't have the mass casualty events like you see in some of the larger city centers. Um, so that's the good news, but we're still we still have a problem obviously. And we'll use this information to approach building managers to amend the windows or lighting of the buildings to prevent this from happening in the future. All of the collected carcasses were given to Liberty Wildlife Rehab Center in Phoenix, where they have non-eagle feather repository program, which distributes the feathers to Native American tribes for ceremonial needs. So those carcasses.
Moving on to another great achievement of ours, Santa Cruz River point counts. In June 2019, Tucson Water began releasing reclaimed water into the downtown stretch of Santa Cruz River. At the same time, we began doing point counts along the same stretch to document any changes brought by water. This month, we wrapped up the second year of the point counts and we're already seeing great trends in the bird diversity here. So we're going to go over these results individually. Uh, we're going to pull some of them out, so don't worry about deciphering what each of the species is. But it's just interesting to see that the water-associated birds that we pulled out, their trends are increasing over time. Since we've only been doing these sur intensive surveys for two years, um, we wanted to compare the years past to what we're seeing now. And so what you're seeing on these First three categories are um, hotspot data from eBird that correspond to the same area. And in the second two, you're seeing point count data from our data. And these are all frequency of detection for each species. So killdeer, we're gonna pull out a couple of them. Killdeer, they don't have to be near water, but in Arizona, um, nesting is especially associated with nearby water. They also really favor flooded fields for foraging. And we can see here that they were not reported until the rewatering started in 2019. And now they're found 100% of the time along that, uh, along that stretch um, of the checklist combined. And then Abrid showies, they love the low elevation riparian corridors. You can see here that they're now found on 100% of checklists on our point counts combined. And black Phoebes are commonly found along streams and ponds with marshy vegetation and the overhanging tree branches. And we're seeing a steady increase in their frequency of detection as well. That's surely indicative of the increased insect load of the area. Vermilion flycatchers, they're not strictly riparian obligates, but they are most often found in areas with high insect count. We often see them in well irrigated parks and things like that. Their numbers have also gone up in the stretch of Santa Cruz River from 20% in the hotspot data to 100% frequency of report in point count data starting immediately um, during the year of water release. Song sparrows are another species now becoming more common. They're usually found near the water's edge. Um, and so they're also increasing steadily. Some wintering vis visitors are also increasing in frequency. They're not gonna be 100% since they are only here in the winter months, but clearly we're starting to see them utilize this area for wintering needs and Back to Jenny. Very cool. So I did want to also, this is ongoing, <laughs> but uh, our Purple Martin study is very cool and it's new. We only started it this last summer and we're continuing it this summer and we'd like to expand it every year sort of into the future. It's a very cool study. And I just want to give you guys a sneak peek of, of how that went last year and sort of how it's, how it's going this year. So Last year, we had 40 participants in 2020. I think we're gonna beat that this summer. We have um, uh, more people involved. We had uh, 63 nesting swirls identified. We already have more than that because we're rechecking all those from last year and uh, 30 plus additional nesting areas. Those are areas we identified using eBird data as well as our own observations, You know, the volunteers and staff to find areas where, you, where Purple Martins congregate. And then 20 plus roosting sites. So this is something I could especially use everyone's help with. If you see Martins hanging out, and these are purple Martins, like the sort of really dark, the males are a very dark blue swallow. Uh, the females are more grayish with patch, you know, sections of white on their lower body. So these are birds that uh, many, if you've lived in the Midwest or the East, you're probably familiar with purple Martins. Well, this is a desert subspecies. They're the same species, so they look and sound very similar but they have very different habits where they nest in saguaro cacti in woodpecker holes within saguaros. So here's some photos from our study last year uh, showing Martin zooming around saguaros. Go ahead, Olya, to the next slide. And uh, so it's sort of 
marking where we had nests. So we've been doing an eye button study this summer. This is a new thing. We didn't do this last year where we take these little tiny devices. There's very small silver devices and there's a photo of like one in someone's hand. They're very small and they're really cool. You can program them to um, how often you want them to take a reading. And we have them set to do it every 15 minutes for this year. And it tracks the temperature and the humidity conditions wherever you put them. So we have some in nesting cavities of per nesting purple martins, and we have many in also just sort of control cavities, cavities and saguaros that are not being nested in. And we're, we're also gonna put some in nest boxes, both insulated and non-insulated nest boxes, and then compare how different the conditions are temperature and humidity wise within these nesting cavities of saguaros. This has been a topic of speculation from many biologists <laughs> over the decades of these birds are nesting in saguaros. That must be a pretty primo spot. I bet it's a lot cooler and more humid than the outside conditions, but we're gonna find out. So these eye buttons are in select nesting cavities right now. And at the end of the season, we, we don't know what the data is till we retrieve the buttons, but at the end of the season, we'll get those buttons out of those cavities when the birds are long gone and we'll download the data and man, stay tuned because that'll be a very interesting um, thing to look at is how the conditions differ from inside nesting cavities versus cavities that weren't nesting versus wooden nest boxes versus just the outside conditions outside of a saguaro. So that'd be very cool. Go ahead to the next one, Olya. So we're doing endoscope. So last year we did endoscope research with just me and Olya doing it. We were able to get a permit for the two of us to figure this out, to figure out how to take a little tiny camera, put it on the end of a really long telescoping pole, and then use that pole and the little camera to look inside nests and see what's going on with those, what, what state, what stage those nests are, we're currently at, which is really important data and has barely been studied by anybody. There was one really cool study that happened in the late 80s from a, from a, a Bridget Stoochbury, who was a researcher out here, she did a really good study, but she didn't have access to electronic endoscopes in 1988. So we're doing this now. And there's been, there's a lot left to discover about this really cool distinctive subspecies of desert purple martin. So we're working on it. And this year we did a training workshop and had volunteers trained on how to use endoscopes and poles, added them to the permits. And we have volunteers out there that are looking inside nests and getting really cool additional data. So That'll be a very, and that's ongoing right now. That started early July and we'll run through the end of August. All right, go ahead to the next one, Olya. And there's a, a, a view of our chart. And this is the sort of sites that we were seeing inside nesting cavities last summer and very similar to what we're seeing this summer, where we have this top left is a mama, a, an adult female purple martin sitting on her eggs. And then top right is some little pink, very fresh new chicks. And then uh, bottom left are some much more grown chicks that are looking very curious and wanting to know what's happening outside that nesting cavity, which is all they've known so far. And then bottom right is a, a baby Martin that is pretty much ready to go. That bird looks ready to fledge. I bet it did fledge the next morning. So that is a bird that was just barely still hanging on in the nest. Now this also is a good point. This photos are showing two, one to two to three eggs or babies in the nest. And that was very typical of what we saw last summer during that non-soon. I saw many nests that only had one big baby by the end or two, or this one, you know, that mama, even at the beginning, she's sitting on only three eggs. We are seeing, commonly seeing five eggs this summer and very often four. So four to five is what we're usually seeing on these nests we're looking in now, which I think is another really good indication of how much better the monsoon is this year compared to last year. Go ahead, Olya. And the quality is amazing that these scopes can get. So go ahead and hit play on this. Oh yeah, and the, it should, if you hover over the bottom, you should get a play, there you go. So this is a little video I shot um, showing oh, it what says, it looks like. It's not playing, it says on the video. Oh, okay, all right, I do have this posted on the Tucson Audubon YouTube channel, if you guys wanna check it out and I'll, I'll link, link to it too in the info email. But it's just sort of like a one minute video showing what happens inside of a nesting cavity. So it's pretty neat, like you, it's the same saguaro, the whole video where early in the season, I go check and these adult martins attack, you know, they come in as a, as a, they call for backup and martins nesting in the area come and help try to chase away the threat, which is something I saw them doing this morning when I was checking um, 
a martin nest, which is pretty cool. They were really first they were focused on me, and then a red tail hawk flew by, and boy, did he get it! Man, they just went after him. Go ahead, Olya, to the next slide. So this purple martin study is very cool. It's very exciting and, and new for us, and it's been really a, a joy to be be creating a new survey effort and just having so much really excellent volunteer help. So, and also we've been doing really good work out in the Altar Valley looking for these birds with our, our, our partners, uh, Altar Valley Conservation Alliance. So I do wanna just end with this idea that the conservation department, while it does do a lot of bird surveys and a lot of nest box monitoring, and I didn't even touch on Habitat at Home, which is another component of the conservation department. There's a whole lot of work that happens from the Tucson Audubon Restoration Crew, which is, part of the same department. So this is within the same conservation department at, at Tucson Audubon here, and they do tremendous work. So here's an example of just one project that they have been working on over the last couple of years. And this is the Corral Canyon restoration work. This is a really cool canyon. It's in the Patagonia Mountains. Um, if you've birded in the Patagonia Mountains, you may be aware of this area, but rare birds do sometimes turn up here. It's a really good spot for those Eastern Azure Bluebirds, really good spot for them. And it's in Patagonia Mountains, just as you're almost to the San Rafael grasslands, when you make that big left turn, the Crawl Canyon's on your right. And it's a really cool area. It does have a private in holding, uh, which is owned by a very nice man who's very friendly. He's a birder and very friendly towards birders. And we have done restoration work on his property with various grants from uh, Fish and Wildlife Service. And they did this really cool project where they did a creek, the Just Not a Bond Restoration Crew, did a creek enhancement project by putting in hundreds and hundreds of poles into the creek to stabilize and, and rebuild the bank uh, that had eroded in the creek. And they've been building a pond for as a refugia for the endangered desert pupfish. So there's a pupfish population now in Corral Canyon that has a built-in circulating stream aspect of it. If you've seen the big pond at Patton Center for Hummingbirds, it looks a lot like that, but bigger and has floating islands of vegetation to benefit all sorts of birds. So this is just one of the many projects that the restoration crew has done to enhance and protect habitat for native birds. Go ahead to the next slide, Olya. And this is the sample. When I asked the restoration crew for information on the projects they have done just from last summer through this current summer, this is the information I got from them. It's almost like too much to talk about. Huge amount of work that they have done. Now, I have it organized for my own uses by important bird areas. So this is restoration work that happened within important bird areas in Arizona. So there's some work here that they did outside of IBAs that probably isn't listed here, but they did a huge amount of work just in this past year. So, I mean, all over the place, Bill Williams, so that's on the Colorado River. They did uh, a saguaro survey and then they did some restoration work, getting rid of invasives. A lot of the work they do is removing invasive plants, which is incredibly important work as we saw from that bighorn fire last year, incredibly important work, backbreaking work too. So a lot of invasive plant treatment they did all over and then building the, the pupfish ponds and creating habitat for turkey roosts and wildlife and birds. But one of the really cool things is the one at the bottom where they have been working to create enhanced habitat for mast bob whites in the Buenos Aires National Wildlife Refuge. So this is done in partnership with the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service, um, US Fish and Wildlife Service, because they own that property and are heading up the mast bobwhite, the very critically endangered, ex, pretty much extirpated, but part of a, a reintroduction program to bring mast bobwhites back into Arizona. And this is a really cool project that they've been doing, creating patches of native plants for like a food, like food patches, food sources for the for the released baby mast bobwhites with their with their parent bobwhite that that uh, protects them out in the wild. So that's a very cool reintroduction project that they're involved with, but also creating habitat for those birds to try to help them survive and thrive out in the Buenos Aires National Wildlife Refuge. And huge amounts of invasive plant mapping that have happened in the Tucson area and the mountains around here. So just a huge amount of work. And I am working with the restoration crew and others at Tucson Audubon are as well to try to help them communicate this amazing work that they do because they're very good at going out there and doing the work and then they're terrible about talking about it. So I just wanted to, to expand sort of the, the definition of what the conservation department is for, for you guys, I mean, and for myself too. It's, it's easy to forget sometimes all this amazing, difficult, incredibly important work that these guys do, these guys and, and ladies do. So, so go ahead, Olya, to the next slide. So just a sneak peek at that and we will gladly take your questions. 
I'm going to go oh, ahead and comment here about Buffalo Crash. Yeah. Okay, go ahead and unmute yourselves, guys. And if anyone has a question or if you want to put it in the chat, that also will work. I just see a comment here about the buffalo grass. Yeah, that's one of the main plants that the restoration crew have been targeting, as well as many other organizations in the Tucson area, because it is quite the problem, that buffalo grass. If you're not aware of that, um, there's a lot of really great resources online about buffalo grass, what it looks like and everything, and it's a terrible invasive that uh, outcompetes native grasses. So it has that aspect of, of ruining habitat by outcompeting native food producing grasses for birds and other wildlife. And it also is a huge fire risk. Not only does it catch fire incredibly easily, it burns at a much higher temperature than normal dead grass. So that's been, that was part of what fueled that bighorn fire in the Catalinas last summer was that buffalo grass that carried the fire very hot through the desert up into the higher elevations and just killed so many saguaro and other cacti because it burns so hot it will just kill sorrows. Okay, so this is Buffalo Up Green Up reported. Yes, yeah, so this is something that the restoration crew was telling me about where the green up is actually incredibly important for their restoration efforts, for their fighting efforts, where they go out and they you have to spray the buffalo grass. It's most effective for buffalo grass or any of these invasives when they're young and they're green and they're tender. And um, yeah, 50% or more green, exactly. They have to be very green and then you spray them and that's the most effective way to just kill them dead before they produce new seeds. So I saw a question about bluebirds too. How did the bluebirds do as compared to past years? Oh yeah, that's that's all you. So they didn't do too bad. Um, maybe about 25% less um, in the number of nests that they did. Uh, but we're also not, I didn't see any nests from other species that we normally use in nest box, like Buick wrens over there and um, bridal titmice that used our nest boxes. So um, just the flycatchers and the bluebirds and about 25% less this year. Excellent. Yeah, the nest box program has been really interesting because that's one of the sort of most quick and effective ways to, to improve a habitat for species that need um, uh, nest, uh, need cavities for nesting is cavities are often a limiting resource for them. And putting up a nest box can really make an area that's otherwise suitable suddenly turn it into breeding habitat. So Paula brings up a really, really interesting point here that if you, if you encounter buffalo grass while you're out birding or just out recreating, hiking, whatever, that you can actually report that online. So she has the link here, buffelgrass.usapn.org. And I'm gonna actually make sure that gets in the email to everybody. Cause if you find buffalo grass, even in your own property, you can report it. And that's great, Paula, thank you. That's very good information. So we'll make sure that goes out to everybody too. And boy, the restoration crew will appreciate it. <laughs> Not just today when I was out in, in the west side of Tucson looking for Purple Martins, I saw the, the uh, Saguaro National Park beat back buffalo grass crew getting ready to go to work. So it's a, it takes, it's so little effort to introduce an invasive species and so much work to try to get rid of it. It's been the takeaway for me from the restoration crew. Yeah. Jenny, I have a purple Martin question. Yes. Um, so did you guys see, um, you saw that they were laying fewer eggs uh, in last year's clutches versus this year's clutches. Do you have a difference or do you know yet if you have a difference in um, hatch rate in how many, let's say you saw three eggs, how many hatched and made it to fledge? It's a good question, Taylor. And they're just starting to hatch now. Now we have, so last year was the very first year we did it. So I sort of was thinking of that as like what was normal. And now I'm getting a sense that that was kind of probably a pretty abnormal year because uh, it was so dry. But I did see nests last year that had a chick and then unhatched eggs. So we do mm -hmm. have that information from last year and they're just starting to sort of hatch out now. So uh, that is something that we are gonna be reporting on at the end of the season. Yeah, it's very cool. Good the clutch size certainly on average is larger this year over last year from what we've seen. Yeah, so yeah that's really interesting. Thank you. All right, any other questions on any of these? these many, many bird surveys and restoration efforts we're uh, talking about. Oh yes, give a report next year. Yes, I, we're planning on doing this pretty much every year. I really wanna 
try to make sure that this information that we find with all the help of these volunteers gets out as broadly as possible. Um, I've been also really big on sharing this data. So another project we do is the Tucson bird count, which is a big urban bird count that we do um, four times a year, but every spring. And I have been very share, sharing with that data and any study that wants either a subset for species. So we've shared data with a study that was looking at verdens and one that was looking at vermilion flycatchers and one with cactus wrens. But I have a grad student now who's, who's going to be looking at the entire data set on a city on a valley wide level comparing it to urbanization, that kind of thing. So as, as things like that come up, we're definitely going to be presenting on that to, to you folks. Olia, can you hear me? Yes. I got a question uh, about your Lucy's warbler nest boxes. Are you still monitoring? No, we have stopped um, at the end of June because normally they would stop at the beginning of June, but we thought maybe some second broods would be observed, but they don't usually nest this late and they're not nesting this late um, this year. Even with as late as they got started for the first nesting? What's that? They wouldn't of the first nesting was very late. And you think they would not uh, nest again, even into July? So, yeah, so they did start late. And so they uh, basically had enough time for one brood is what I'm uh, thinking, because I didn't notice another brood for them after the first one hatched and the middle time. So they, they didn't, they weren't lucky enough to experience the, the rains that we started getting in July. So it's it, June, it was pretty dry. And so at that point they have completed their nesting cycle. And they're, they usually nest very early um, spring, my, uh, spring nesters because they are cavity nesters. So it is a bit, a bit um, warmer, but they take advantage of the spring insect load for them. And it hasn't been very good this year. Now, a lot of our nest boxes for Lucy's are in yards where people report what's going on with them. So if people did see summer nesting, that would be uh, reported to us. Right, right. If, if that was... What's that? I was, I have some nest boxes down Smith Canyon and oh, yes. I um, <laughs> was going to go down and check them. Um, but maybe it's not worth it. Thing. Uh, the last time I checked was about the first of July, okay. and they pretty much finished. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, you probably won't see checking. any new. Yeah. yeah, probably won't see any new activity there. But yeah, so if you checked in July, then that's probably um, the finish of the data set there. Do you create artificial soar nesting areas, and are they successful, Jenny? Yeah, so I did comment, I, um, I did type in a response, oh, but yeah, that's a good question is like trying to make it. So the desert purple martins so far, as far as we know, pretty much exclusively nest in living saguaro cavities. They've never been reported using nest boxes of any kind. And we are going to be looking into them. So we're going to sort of do a prototype this summer of an insulated box because a regular nest box clearly doesn't cut it. It must get too hot or not humid enough inside of those boxes compared to a saguaro. So there was work done on this by other researchers for the cactus virgins pygmy owls trying to create artificial nesting cavities for them that mimicked saguaros. And they ended up making these huge sort of styrofoam insulated concoctions that worked pretty well. So we will be trying something, different types of insulated boxes and um, using eye buttons to test the conditions inside and see how they compare to actual saguaro cavities. And then maybe next year, depending on, we do have a big grant application in with um, Disney Conservation Fund. And if we get that big concert, that big funding package from them, as well as uh, funds a lot of great partners to help with this project too, we'll be probably doing a nest box design contest with you know, high schools in Tucson to try to come up with some designs that we will then test. And then of course, let the Martins vote, you know, put them up and see if the Martins like them to nest in them. So yeah, that is something we have been thinking about actively and are, are working on. All right, any other questions?
Any other questions? Oh, such great questions. Thanks guys. And you were a terrific audience. Thank you so much. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Jenny and Olia. Um, I'm going to stop recording now.